Thank you very much, uh, Gronya, and uh, it's great to be here. Can I also um, uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's a great panel we've got here tonight and uh, a, a very topical topic. Um, for me, it's particularly a pleasure. I'm, this is my first formal kind of interaction since I've been in the committee. Uh, I've uh, had interactions with the AIIA over many years uh, in several locations, uh, obviously in Canberra when I was a, a public servant there, but uh, coming back to Perth a few years ago, it's been a, a great place to interact and you know get into the, the teeth of some policy issues that we, we are dealing with. Um, tonight, uh, we'll, it's the usual panel format. Uh, we'll have the speakers. I'll introduce them one by one as they, as they speak. Uh, the three speakers will uh, give a few minutes presentation, around about 10 minutes, uh, their reflections on the topic and their twist on the topic. Um, and, and following that, uh, we'll have a Q&A session and, and, it, and we'll be able to um, um, get deeper into the subject. I'm particularly pleased tonight because we have representatives from three different perspectives. We have um, a politician in the trade portfolio who's a, you know, struggling with the, the, the government reaction and trying to come up with innovative ideas from a government perspective and an opposition perspective. We have a academic whom we all know and love very much in this town who is very, uh, very policy focused, you know, challenging government and challenging the policy uh, framework. And then we have a practitioner, somebody who's dealing on the day-to-day -day issues of lobsters being stopped on the wharf or on the tarmac. So I prepare yourself for a very rich discussion. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, in that context, let me uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Wilson, who is we're actually a guest in his neighborhood here at the UWA. Jeff is um, at the, uh, he's the research director of the Perth USA Center. He provides leadership and strategic direction in developing the center's research program across its publications. Uh, policy and dialogue activities. Uh, as you know, as many of you know, uh, Jeff is, specializes in, in the regional economic integration of the Indo-Pacific. He has expertise in the politics and policy of trade agreements, regional economic institutions, and Australia's economic ties with Asia. He has been featured in many local and international media, increasingly so, I must say, well done whoever's your media advisor, they need a pay rise, um, and he's contributed to a range of uh, track two dialogues uh, between Australia and key regional partners. Um, he's been a great friend as well in the last few years since I've been in, uh, in Perth, and uh, he's even spoken at my workplace a couple of times. Jeff, please, the floor is yours. It's up to you, whichever you feel more comfortable. It would be probably easier. Minister. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say thanks for having me along to the AAAWA branch. This is only the second time I've spoken here, and the first time was eight years ago on my second day in Perth when I came <laughs> over from Canberra. We made you a presentation. Yeah. We made you a presentation. Yeah, yes. Uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> and so it's been eight years, and I, it's really a pleasure to be back. I wish I could be back talking about a more positive topic for Australia at the moment. Um, look, in a foreign, if, we, if you guys are used to foreign policy discussions, trade is usually about the most boring part of foreign policy. Um, but this year, for someone like me with a PhD in trade policy, it's been really interesting, unfortunately for all the wrong reasons. Um, 2020 has been an absolute disaster for Australia's ability to engage in the world through trade links. Um, and we've had multiple external shocks and threats have clouded the trade outlook. And I'd argue these are likely to persist past 2020 as well. Um, so what I'll try and do this evening is just set a bit of a scene by talking about four big headwinds that have really been facing Australia's trade outlook this year um, before we get a business perspective from Daryl and a policy perspective from Madeline. Um, so my core argument was there's been kind of four horsemen of the trade apocalypse hitting the Australian economy this year. Um, the first of it, which we all know, is the COVID pandemic itself. 
um, where there's been a number of interruptions to international trade due to severed international connections. Um, when flights aren't running, when ships aren't coming in and out of ports at the rate they were, simply getting products in and out of Australia is now a major challenge and keeps Daryl busy on a daily basis. Um, we also see that the movement of people due to closed borders is completely shut. So for our education and tourism industry, many of those, that's lights out. Um, and developing new trade relationships, for example, building a trade relationship with Indonesia after Australia completed the uh, bilateral free trade agreement in June this year, is extraordinarily difficult when you can't go to Indonesia to actually meet new commercial partners. Um, the Australian Industry Group, which is a manufacturing lobby group, actually did a survey of its members and found that over half have seen major interruptions of some sort to their ability to either import products they need to manufacture or export stuff to final markets. Um, that then spilled over into the COVID recession. Um, this is the worst global recession in a century uh, due to the quite necessary public health interventions we've seen taken around the world. Um, and so we're seeing massively negative economic growth rates. Negative 6% in a country that's doing well, minus 10 or 12% in some countries that have been really badly hit by coronavirus. Um, and in 2020, only China, and perhaps we'll see at the end of the year, maybe Vietnam and Taiwan, but at the moment, only China is actually going to deliver a positive growth number this year, and even then, that's going to be 0.2%, down from its 6% in the past. Um, generally speaking, this obviously crimps demand for Australian key, Australia's key export commodities, um, with the one exception being the resource sector, um, where Western Australia's exports have been held up, from, held up by China's fiscal stimulus, as well as a very unfortunate for Brazil collapse in its supply of iron ore due to the way it's been ravaged by coronavirus, particularly in the mining state of Minas Gerais. Um, but for most other sectors outside the mining industry, the outlook is uh, red ink everywhere. Um, we've also then seen that turn into a global turn towards protectionism. Um, historically, we see it's very common that when there are poor economic conditions, governments respond by resorting to protectionism. You know, this is the discourse of the economy is doing badly, so we have to protect local jobs in some way. Um, and we've definitely seen this this year. Um, according to a compilation by Global Trade, Al Trade Alert, a Swiss, a Swiss think tank on trade, um, governments around the world have enacted, enacted 1,700 new protectionist policies in the first 10 months of this year alone. Last year, the number was 500. So this is a threefold increase of what we saw last year, which had been a high watermark, because in 2018, it had only been 250. Um, this is particularly prominent in agriculture, where a number of governments have enacted uh, tr agricultural protectionist policies, ostensibly to improve and secure national food security. Um, but if you're an agricultural net exporter like Australia, this puts just yet another barrier on top of the problems that you've already got. Um, and finally, the most dramatic of the four horsemen, and one that's occupied much of my year this year, has been the Australia-China trade war, as some call it, or as I've been referring to it, a trade bashing. Um, I think it would be fair to say and that Australia-China relations have not been on an upward trajectory for a number of years now. Um, and what we saw was a major slip in these relations in April this year when the Morrison government made international calls for an independent inquiry into the origins of coronavirus through the World Health Assembly. Um, this was caused significant political consternation in China. Um, so what we saw in, was in May, the Chinese government started applying politically motivated and technically without much merit trade sanctions against a number of Australian exports. Um, it started with barley and then they continued coming every couple of weeks and have continued like that over the last six months. Um, and as of last week, I have the list here, we've now had 13 products subject to this in some way. Um, they are coal, barley, beef, education, tourism, coal a second time, wine, cotton, wheat, wool, sugar, coal a third time, lobsters, timber, wine a second time. Um, together, those 13 industries exported 59 billion Australian dollars of exports to China alone last year. So that's the footprint of which the damages uh, could be spread across. Um, the only major commodities in the Australia-China trade that haven't been affected are resources, particularly iron ore and natural gas, which is largely because China depends on Australian supply for its own industrial security. Um, I'd also note that these sanctions have fallen particularly hard on the agriculture sector, um, which has developed and 
put a lot of work in the last decade in developing um, China business due to the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement. Um, so through no fault of their own, much of that burden is actually being borne by Australian farmers. Um, what can we do about this, these four horsemen? Um, directly, I'd probably suggest there's not a lot we can do to change these headwinds. Uh, the COVID pandemic is what it is. We have to wait for a vaccine. Um, and whatever your view on the Australia-China relationship, the fact is here that China has chosen to summarily ignore international law, is flagrant, flagrantly breaching both its WTO commitments and provisions in the Australia-China Free Trade Agreement to apply these sanctions. Um, make of that what you will. But indirectly, there's a real urgent need for action. And so for the first time in perhaps 30 or so years, I'd argue that Australia really needs to think about developing what I'd call a defensive trade strategy. In the past, we've been used to thinking about trade as something that grows consistently. Australia was located in the Indo-Pacific region. It was very dynamic. Every year, our export numbers went up by 5 to 15% through the assiduous efforts of the corporate sector and not much on behalf of government apart from maybe signing a free trade agreement once in a while, but it was a story of growth and it was a story of how fast can we grow. Do we, if we do poorly, we grow a little bit. If we do well, we grow a lot. Um, we're now in a different setting where it's actually not an offensive growth story, but actually a defensive one about trying to keep supply chains open due to these interruptions, trying to do something to address the global spread of protectionism, which will really fall hard on our agriculture sector, and trying to do something to get out of the logjam that is the Australia-China bilateral trade bashing. Um, and what I wanted to do now was um, let uh, throw up to Daryl for now. Oh, Brendan, are you going to introduce? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we'll hear from Daryl soon. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. And as usual, uh, Jeff is uh, very eloquent in, in, in summarizing you know, the issues that, that come to fore. Um, I'm going to introduce now Daryl Daisley, who we have to thank very much because he stepped in in the last minute this afternoon because Alex wasn't able to uh, join us due to a family situation. Um, Daryl... It's a particular pleasure for me to introduce Daryl because I knew him when we played in a hockey team together. So apart from all his great credentials as a trade uh, practitioner, he's a fantastic hockey forward. <laughs> Scores many goals. Um, so Daryl uh, currently is the director uh, at uh, Pitcher Partners Taxation Services team. Has uh, over 34 years experience working with a range of organizations, including the Australian Customs Service, a top-tier accounting firm, as well as uh, managing his own consulting business. Daryl is an expert in international trade, customs, free trade agreements, fuel tax credits, and various other areas of indirect tax and government expenditure. He has managed uh, Australian industry particip particip participation plans, customs and fuel tax issues for some of the largest mining infrastructure and resource processing projects across Australia. He has been on the Association of, of Mining and Exploration Companies Corporate Regulation and Taxation Committee since 1999 and currently represents AMAC at the ATO's Fuel Schemes Advisory Forum. Daryl was the chairman of uh, WACCI's International Trade Committee between 2008 and 2015. So we're, we're looking Daryl, again, from a practitioner's perspective, how you see on the ground um, COVID and its ensuing uh, problems affecting exporters and importers. Eventually. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and, and talk. Um, and Jeff and I have actually spoken at a number of events, and it's like the uh, academic, the actual business consultant that has to deal with clients and actually understand uh, what government is doing 
for us and with us. Um, and then the, the struggles that business have in terms of trying to deal with all that's happening. So Jeff said 2020 has been um, a nightmare a year, year for him. It's actually been in turmoil since uh, January 2017 in my world. Who started work in January of 2017? And he's about to finish very shortly. So the, the world from a trade perspective, um, from a business perspective, really turned upside down when, when Trump came in. Um, so we've had significant issues um, with that particular administration from a, a business perspective. Um, and then we are lumped with uh, COVID this year. And even though I, I did have a quick chat with Jeff about the title of tonight's one, Australian Trade After COVID 2019. This isn't stopping on 1 January 2021. Um, this is going to go on for quite some time. Um, so it's, it's, there is some good news, um, but a lot of it at the moment is extremely challenging for business. So just to quickly touch, um, exporters on the front line. So what we've seen over, over the, this year is lower demand. And if you have a look at some of the graphs that are up there, the left-hand side one, um, this came out of the WTO. So in essence, everyone can see where the globe was heading. Everything was really good prior to COVID. And COVID's had a significant impact um, to the baseline. And that's a grey line down here for everybody. Um, the optimistic view now, and this has only been since October, is we're potentially looking at the blue line, so you know, a fairly good recovery. So this is on a global basis. The pessimistic one is that we're about to go down again, that's the orange line. Um, and even the WTO report that this was written on was October. Um, and if I... If I if I'm honest, you know, that, that article and that proposition didn't really take into account what's just happened in the last couple of weeks, you know, throughout Europe with the second wave and what is now happening to the US in terms of them being smashed with their COVID numbers and the like. Um, and we're probably sheltered from that, you know, as a, as a nation, as a country, um, but we, we do trade. You know, a lot of what we do is cross-border. So we're not removed from, from what's happening globally. Um, and, and yet again, you know, a lot of the numbers were good. And then the main thing to take away is, lo and behold, all the major industries, whether it be rural, manufacturing, metal oils, coal, all impacted. Everyone was impacted. Um, even though there were some businesses that, that have done reasonably well um, through this period, some small domestic players, the classic that I had a chat with Jeff about some time ago was hand sanitizers when there was short supply. So suddenly all the alcohol producers that made gin and all the whiskies and all the like, they immediately pivoted to go and start making hand sanitizers. That was a, you know, and, and they did pretty well out of it, but that was a short term solution. So in essence, you know, they were able to quickly pivot, um, generate some revenue domestically from not selling gin to actually making hand sanitizers to, to fix that urgent need we had for personal protective equipment at the time. But now most of that has come off. So the big companies that make it, you know, the government's contracted with half a dozen major players to make sure that we've got plenty of stock of it. And lo and behold, the ACCC is monitoring, you know, some of those major suppliers because some of this stuff you know, doesn't actually qualify as being suitable to be used with COVID. Um, so supply chain disruptions have been absolutely um, horrendous. Let's get out of here. Right. So just in terms of COVID, you know, from a business perspective, what has it actually meant? So massive global disruption of supply chain. Air freight is under continued pressure. Um, so I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but the, the Australian government introduced an international assistance program, freight assistance mechanism for um, air freight. And that really only kicked in about seven to 8% of what was normally there. And it's expensive. 
and it's only being really utilised by major exporters who had long-term mature contracts overseas. So the small to medium-sized business can't get their stuff onto the, onto the planes. So at one of our presentations that we did back in May, and not much has moved since May from a, a flight perspective, um, and most people may not be aware, but air freight in Perth, a big chunk of it is on commercial airliners. Um, where they ha actually have belly space to put cargo in. We have a lot, a lot of what is called low-cost carrier aircraft into, into Perth, and that's just passengers. So the Air Asia's of the world, you know, Tiger Airlines, they don't carry cargo. But Qantas and Singapore Airlines and the like, they make their money not on passengers but on cargo. So Qantas gave us some stats back in, in April where they were getting like 100 flights a month that could take cargo that went down to single digits within about a month period, you know, over a couple of weeks. So if you're a, um, a budding, entre budding entrepreneur who has a fantastic product that you want to export and you were looking at selling it um, overseas and utilising air freight, well, guess what? You can't do it. And in March through to May, we had a lot of um, interactions through websites, webinars, Zoom calls and the like, and everyone said, well, we'll be able to start again in July, won't we? July, August, I'm going, well, not this year. What do you mean not this year? Well, I went to a presentation last week. Richard Goida spoke, good WA boy. He's the chairman of Qantas, and he basically alluded that there won't be any international flights next year, 2021. They're not looking at scheduled services. There could be some repatriation flights and the like until we get a, a vaccine. Um, you know, so everyone's, everyone's hanging on this vaccine, but... A lot of business people are going to go, well, we've started Zoom calling. That seems to be working okay. We may need to do that for a little bit longer than what we thought. Right, so... Um, actually, I'll, oh, sorry, I'll go back because it's it's just expansive in terms of... What have we got there? So we've got Air Freight. Got federal government's trying to help. Sea Freight, I'm not sure if anybody's aware but there is some significant headwinds around sea freight and port charges in Australia, as well as globally. So we've had some significant issues with the Port of Sydney, um, and it gets quite complex in terms of empty containers and not being able to get them onto ships. So everything gets moved in, most, most uh, goods that are traded are moved through containers, sea containers. Um, but you've got to be able to, if you're an importer or an exporter, you've got to be able to access an empty container to fill it and to put it onto a ship. Well, over the COVID period, um, you know, there were voyages that were being cancelled. Uh, we had a discussion with Fremantle Port Authority in about April, May, and they weren't sure of what was going to happen after August, when normally they would know six to nine months out how many ships are going to arrive, when they're going to arrive, how much uh, cargo can they bring in, what type and size of the vessels are going to arrive. Um, they had very little information you know, at the back end of this year. I mean, it's getting better. Um, and when you read some of the information about trade between the US and Europe, you know, um, that's improving. Uh, but the cost of freight has just skyrocketed and it's not, it's not coming down. Um, another thing, so most of the stuff that we um, use, glasses, jugs, you know, all comes from overseas, um, comes on vessels. We've now got significant issues with crew change on vessels. So sadly, some of these seafarers have been on those vessels for nine, ten months. Um, and, you know, and our government's making it very difficult to actually do any kind of crew change, get them off that ship, get them back home so they can have a break. Um, and sadly, it's, you know, majority of them are Filipinos, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis and the like. Um, so that's a significant issue. And that's not just one that Australia's got, um, all of our major trading partners, all those, all those particular um, shipping lines have got the same issue. So it's almost like we need a global solution to deal with the crew change. Because, I mean, so, some of them, you know, they're meant to get tested before they go on the ship. We've had a couple of outbreaks up in Port Hedland. Um, you know, people in Port Hedland were extremely nervous and frightened about what was going to happen. They're on a ship. You know, they're out at sea or they're at Anchorage. You know, it's, it's a closed environment that can be easily controlled. 
but it caused a significant problem for the state government. And, you know, we had other issues with other vessels in other states. The other big one that we, that we have a lot of discussion with our clients about is just in time versus just in case. So just in time is where you as a consumer place an order and expect to get it within two or three days. And when supply chains work and they work well, that just in time basis works very well. But when the supply chain is interrupted, you ordering your piece of kit from Amazon doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it um, within three to four days. So a lot of companies are having to understand, do they now need to order large amounts of stock? Bring it on shore. Increase the size of their logistics holdings within a country or closer to a market. And that's a big shift for, for businesses. They can't just change overnight. I mean, we're dealing with a couple of large businesses that want to move from just in time to just in case. And it is significant expenditure to change that. You know, the modelling. And that's on the understanding that supply chains are going to improve at some point not too far out in the distance. In the distance. Um, so that's been a big one, you know. And just in time has been with us now for the last probably 20, 25, 30 years. Just in case was Japanese from memory from the 50s and 60s. Um, they did it very well. Um, and then the other big one is border restrictions and the movement of business travellers. So I was up in Indonesia in early December talking about the Indonesian agreement. We went to Malaysia straight after that. We were meant to be back up there in March, first week of March, um, to close some business deals. Didn't happen. And they want to know when we're going to be back. Well, it's not been this year. We've had a few Zoom calls and we're keeping fingers crossed that it might be next year sometime. But I'm not racing to Indonesia at the present. Um, yeah, so the <laughs> COVID just has smashed everything. But there is some good news in terms of how Australia is responding to all that. And I'll just quickly go over these last couple of points. Try to. Right, hang on, let's try that. Let's try praise down. No. Bingo. Okay, so we talked about COVID, um, but what's happened this year is a lot of mercantilism, um, nationalism as well. But believe it or not, a lot, a lot has been happening in the free trade agreement space. So Indonesia got signed in May, RCEP, the regional... Uh, agreement with China and all of ASEAN and Australia and New Zealand, that just got um, signed and entry into force, meaning when can it all get used? Um, hopefully, middle of next year. Yeah. Um, and then we've got other things. Stuff is still happening globally. So Brexit <laughs> is almost here. We don't know what's going to be almost here, but you know the, the deadline for breakfast, Brexit is almost here. And there was a period there... There was a period there for about three months where there was just no news. It didn't figure uh, in the news. Um, and then the last one is the impact of the US election and the outcome of that, which has almost now been resolved. Um, so that, there's some positives on the, on the back of that particular outcome for Australia in terms of its dealings with... Let's just... Uh, yeah. So this is a really busy slide and there's a lot of information on here, but the flavour of this is, is quite um, stark and, and really good news. So Australia believes in free trade and we believe in establishing good relationships with our trading nations, not like the Trump administration, for instance. So we've got RCEP that I mentioned. We've got the Indonesian Agreement, which got signed in May of 2020. We've, got, we've had the emergence of Vietnam as potentially as an alternative to China. Um, the European Union and Vietnam have signed a free trade agreement which came into effect in August. Um, Australia signed a Singapore digital trade agreement a couple of months ago. 
Japan, the UK have signed a trade deal. Cambodia, South Korea, there's free trade discussions. Um, so there's free trade discussions all over the place, which is good for us. And the last couple, everyone might be aware, Australia and the UK. So Boris wants to do a deal with anybody. <laughs> anybody that is prepared to do a deal with him. So That's we certainly... Good cross on the as well. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there's some competition there, and we're probably in a very, very strong position in relation to those particular discussions. The other one is that we're also in discussions with the EU about formalising um, and establishing a free trade agreement. So from a government perspective, you know, there's a lot happening. Uh, from a business perspective, there's a lot happening in this in this trade space. And as as Jeff rightly pointed out, trade is what's keeping us alive at the moment in terms of our exports and those exports that are being accepted by our major trading partners. You know, so iron ore is the big one. So businesses this year have just been absolutely you know, smashed left, right, and centre, trying trying to understand not what's just happening. Um, in a year's time, they're trying to understand what's going to happen next week, in a month's time, in a quarter's time. You know, it's very, very difficult to, to predict. So, like, uh, I'll, I'll close by saying in my time as a customs officer many, many years ago, something might happen every six months or once a year that was of note. In the last couple of years, it's gone from that once a year thing to once a quarter to once a fortnight to once a week, to every second day. So if you read a paper these days, front page, it's either going to be about trade or cyber. Those two topics dominate now our, our landscape. So um, yeah, business really struggles. So if a consultant struggles to keep up, it's an absolute minefield for business. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl. It's uh, quite grounding to, to hear it from the, from the ground. Um, our last speaker, our, uh, you know, we, we've saved the, la the, the best for last, is uh, Madeline King. Uh, many of you here will know Madeline. Uh, she, she's coming back home again. Uh, as many of you will know, she, Madeline was uh, here at the Perth USA Asia Center as the founding executive and Chief Operating Officer between uh, 2012 and 2016 when she resigned to uh, um, stand for the seat of brand, which was uh, became uh, available when the person who recruited me, Gary Gray, left uh, into the resources sector. So, so Madeline was elected uh, to the federal parliament in July 2016 as the member for brand. Um, she was re-elected last year in May 2019. 2019. In June 2019, she was promoted to the front bench of the Labour opposition to serve as a Shadow Minister for Trade. She previously held positions of Minister, Shadow Minister for Consumer Affairs, Shadow Minister Assisting for Small Business, and Shadow Minister Assisting for Resources. So a lot of apprenticeship to come to the trade portfolio, which is great. Um, Prior to joining the Perth USA Asia Center, she was the chief of staff at the UWA right here. Um, in her leadership of the Perth USA Asia Center, she helped to bring a unique WA perspective to international discussion on Australia's role in the emerging Indo-Pacific region. Um, Madeline has strong personal links with her seat of brand, which includes the major centers of Rockingham and Quinana, having grown up in the area and attended local public schools. Madeline, uh, can I please invite you to say a few words? Thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks, Brendan, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, I'd just also like to take the chance to acknowledge uh, Dr Sue Boyd as well, who I worked with for about a year on the UWA centenary. Before I went to the Perth US Asia Centre, we had a cracking good time running that good party. 
That's uh, <laughs> we we um we did a good job, I think. So uh, thanks to Sue, we always had some great discussions on her great uh, history and diplomacy, and uh, and at the university itself. Um, I'd like to thank the institute uh, tonight for inviting me along for this uh, great discussion about international trade, uh, the work you do in promoting. A uh, greater understanding of international affairs right across the country is, is very valuable to everybody. Um, you've heard tonight uh, from uh, academic Jeff, who uh, I worked with at the Perth US Asia Centre, uh, and uh, the practitioner, uh, Daryl. And so as the politician, now it's my chance to show just how out of touch I am uh, with uh, <laughs> the realities that <laughs> you may have uh, presented. Um, so you can pull me up on that uh, afterward. Uh, before I get on to the more contemporary issues in trade, I just try to reflect a bit about Australia's history uh, in trade. So uh, tens of thousands of years before European settlement in this country, our First Nations uh, people had an extensive domestic trade network that stretched, of course, across the thousands of kilometres uh, of this continent. Boomerangs made in Central Australia found their way out to Arnhem Land and to nearby islands, and didgeridoos from Arnhem Land reached Central Australia, and pearl shells from the Kimberley here in WA were also traded into South Australia. Uh, the indigenous people of WA's uh, Midwest uh, mined ochre from the world ranges, uh, and that was used in medicine, uh, rock art, and the preservation of animal skins, and they delivered it on foot to neighbouring uh, indigenous tribes. Then international trade with Australia started in the 1700s when the Sulawesi fishermen reached Australia's uh, northern coast and discovered the bountiful supplies of trepang or, or sea cucumber, which was in high demand in China. So that's the sort of start of our first uh, global supply chain, if you like, uh, emerging out of this country. So in return for access to certain fishing areas, uh, the Aboriginal people uh, received goods such as cloth, uh, tobacco, rice and knives. So this trade had a positive influence on local people and it's believed that some Indigenous men travelled uh, to Sulawesi and back aboard the Macassan boats uh, and learnt to speak their language. The Macassan culture was reflected in the songs and dances and the art of the northern Indigenous people and as is still on some of the, the rock paintings that people are discovering today. So we fast forward a few hundred years from that first uh, time of international trade with this country and it remains uh, an overwhelmingly positive story for Australia as we've heard earlier this evening. It's beneficial for our trading partners uh, in the region where hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in the past uh, several decades. In modern day Australia it is thought that one in five uh, workers are in trade related industries. Australia is the world's largest exporter of iron, co iron ore, coal, natural gas and wool. The second largest exporter of beef and aluminium ores. We're the fourth largest exporter for wine, cotton and sugar. The fifth for pearls and silver. The sixth largest exporter for gold and the list will go on. Uh, here in WA, the china fueled resources investment boom that began in the mid-2000s transformed our state's export sector into the genuine powerhouse that we know it is today. Our merchandise exports, led by resources and agri agricultural products, now account for about half of the nation's total exports. And this year, the export success of our miners and farmers has really cushioned the sharp blow that COVID-19 has delivered to our national economy. As uh, has been said before, it, it is um, what keeps the country going right now. Australia relies on open markets and the rules-based multilateral trading system in order to sell our goods and services to the world. Internationally agreed rules are invaluable for smaller nations such as ourselves, and in fact, they are essential. Um, but as we speak tonight, uh, there are genuine reasons to be concerned about the immediate future. Obviously, as we've spoken about, the, the global economic and trade outlook is, is bleak. Um, our economy is, is in deep recession and, and so are most of our major partners. The WTO, the World Trade Organisation, has forecast a 9.2% decline in the volume of world merchandise trade uh, in 2020, and the good news is that this projected decline is less than what the WTO forecast back in April as the first wave of the pandemic took hold. The falls uh, around Asia of 4.5% uh, will be smaller than in other regions around the globe. Trade volume growth is expected to rebound to 7.2% in 2021, uh, but will remain well below the pre-crisis trend, and, and Daryl showed that. This is with us for some time to come. 
As we know, the pandemic has closed borders and disrupted uh, global supply chains. And on top of this, we've seen a drastic breakdown uh, in recent years of the multilateral system that since World War II has fostered uh, open trade uh, and underpinned global economic growth. And we all, I hope, and I'm sure all of us here tonight hope that the incoming uh, Biden administration in the US can help restore America's leadership of the multilateral system that it literally built uh, uh, in the wake of that war, and uh, time only will tell. Australia must do for its part all it can with the US and other like-minded nations in defending free trade and reviving the reputation of the World Trade Organization, uh, which has been debilitated in recent times. Uh, it is a difficult and precarious climate for open and international trade, and that's before we even get to uh, the, the topic in the paper every day of Australia's tensions uh, with China. Um, this is, as we've heard, making life, you know, extraordinarily uncertain for exporters. Uh, the list of exports that are uh, having trouble getting into China is growing by the week, and as Jeff said, actually almost by the day. Uh, we've got barley, wine, red meat, coal, cotton, seafood, sugar and timber, um, and then, again, we've got now 50 ships with coal um, that are not going in, the sort of latest news on that. Uh, other industries are left to wonder uh, if they're next, and quite rightly, uh, and make no mistake, there's, there's billions of dollars in trade and, and literally thousands of jobs across the country are at risk uh, if this trading relationship fails. So over the past few weeks, I've been speaking to a number of uh, Australian business people who are deeply concerned that the, the government is not doing enough to resolve these tensions. Uh, they fear the government has no real plan to repair the trading relationship between Australia and China, and our exporters are appealing to the Australian government uh, for leadership. In fact, some of them have said they feel uh, quite uh, abandoned by the government. Now, uh, justifiably, I'm often asked, uh, what would Labor do differently? Now, my immediate response, uh, as always, is to point out that we are sadly in opposition, but it, it is that is the result of, of the, the vote of the Australian people. And as we are in opposition, it's therefore up to the Morrison government uh, to take the responsibility as the elected government of the day to draw upon its diplomatic resources and do all it can to fix the situation. But I've got some ideas that could help, and I'll share a few of them with you tonight. Uh, now, first, I want to acknowledge that I understand and, and Labor understands that the relationship with China is increasingly complex and, and we believe it must always be managed in the national interest. Uh, I believe we can stand up for our values at the same time as we have a productive trading relationship with China. This has happened before and, in fact, it has been the case for decades. The government should be making it clear at every available opportunity that Australia seeks a strong economic relationship with China. That although Australia will have differences with China, we cannot decouple. Trade is, after all, mutually beneficial. The biggest losers from a reduction in trade volume are the Australian and Chinese people. And that's the message that needs to be hammered home, in my opinion. Secondly, uh, the government must immediately appoint a dedicated Minister for Trade on to work on resolving this crisis. Some of you may be aware that the government uh, last month effectively downgraded the trade portfolio by making Simon Birmingham the Finance Minister and Special Minister of State as well as Government Leader in the Senate, and that's in addition to the portfolios of trade, tourism and, and investment. Uh, he, he's like the Minister for everything. Uh, and that's not right in this time of crisis. Uh, the Prime Minister is expected to appoint a new Trade Minister at some point soon, but we don't know when and we don't know who. Uh, and frankly, again, in my opinion, I don't think there is a worse time for the trade portfolio to be left in limbo like this. Thirdly, uh, the government should draw on the expertise of Australian businesses who actually do business with China and have been doing business with China for decades. The agricultural and resources industries, along with many others, have long-term links with China. Uh, they are the true ballast in the relationship. And these business leaders, I believe they have a legitimate place in this important national discussion. Yet those who do speak up about the need to strengthen the relationship with China often have their motives questioned and have been labelled as China sympathisers. Jeff Raby, uh, Australia's former ambassador to China, uh, and some of you are aware of his new book, as he, as when he's promoting that, he's also lamented this month that China policy in Australia has been reduced to a binary debate between sycophancy and hostility. 
This has to change. The government could start by respectfully listening to the corporate leaders who hold grave concerns about the way the relationship is being managed. Fourth, the Prime Minister needs to step up and lead this important national discussion about China. Uh, former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop, uh, another West Australian, said recently, we need some very calm and considered diplomacy if we are to resolve this situation. What we see instead is a Prime Minister who has failed to admonish inflammatory and frankly xenophobic uh, comments about China and the Chinese diaspora by some of his own MPs. Of course, China takes notes of these comments uh, and this only serves to make a bad situation worse and gives uh, Chinese authorities even more excuses for lashing out at Australia. Finally, I believe the government must develop a clear strategy to genuinely uh, diversify our export markets. Uh, this is something I've been speaking about for a long time. Our exporters need a government that does more than simply point to free trade agreements and hope that it leads to an increase in trade. And I note the extensive list is a good thing, but it can't just stop at inking these agreements. There's a lot of uh, groundwork to be done. True trade diversification takes years and years and years, and it needs real commitment. Uh, but this government has failed to do the hard work uh, to open up these new markets. Every day, every minister with a portfolio that relates to any of our export industries should wake up and ask themselves, what am I going to do today in my portfolio to ensure there are better diversity in our markets? That's what they have to do. It's this kind of everyday commitment, the really hard graft that every minister of the Crown in this country needs to work at to make sure we can actually diversify our markets. Can I point to one of the a glaring example of where the government has a, a roadmap to diversity but has failed uh, to follow it? Um, the government had a five... 100-page India economic strategy released back in uh, 2018, written by the former Department of Foreign Affairs uh, Secretary Peter Varghese. They have implement, they've implemented one of the 20 recommendations, and uh, now we know that they're not planning to implement any more after the recent Senate estimates. Now, Peter Varghese's report found that no single market over the next 20 years offered more growth opportunities than India in areas such as education, agriculture, energy resources, tourism, healthcare, financial services, infrastructure, science and sport. But here we are, we're more than two years later, and as I said, just one of those 20 recommendations have been acted on. Meanwhile, official figures show India's share of Australian merchandise exports is more than 30% 30 30 below the 2018 level when Mr Varghese delivered this report. And this is before COVID hits in, right, and those restrictions. It's a similar story with uh, another of our emerging giant neighbours, Indonesia, which accounts for just 2% of Australia's exports. And, you know, we did just finish the IHEPA agreement and uh, there's been no chance to, to cement it. Um, you know, we had hoped, the Labor supported the, the Indonesia-Australia Com Economic Comprehensive uh, Partnership. Uh, we had hoped it would boost trade volumes. Um, it has not and it won't for a while uh, with the, the restrictions based on uh, COVID. Nonetheless, more work still needs to be done uh, and the government has to lead this. Uh, free trade agreements uh, and encouraging words by politicians and elected representatives in this country achieve only so much. The, the government seems to believe that it's the responsibility of the businesses themselves to open up the markets once the free trade agreement has been signed. Uh, but it's evident from our history that little happens unless the Commonwealth takes the lead in diversification. Former Prime Ministers Bob Hawke and John Howard understood that new trade and investment uh, do not occur by accident. They both played active roles in actively overseeing and, le and lending support to business deals that opened up new markets uh, in China for iron ore and LNG, you know, going to these countries and visiting with Chinese leaders to cement the Mount China deal and then the development of the Northwest Shelf. Um, so finally, I'll conclude by restating my belief that Australia can thrive in the future if uh, we remain a nation engaged with the world, a nation that is open to trade, uh, a nation that shuns insularity. Ten days ago, Australia signed up to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, a free trade agreement that includes 15 of our Indo-Pacific neighbours, including China. Uh, the partnership has the potential to enable greater regional economic 
integration, uh, creating a better rules-based trading arrangements that will provide more certainty for Australian businesses. Uh, Labor has always supported trade agreements that create jobs for Australians, boost economic growth and improve living standards. In fact, Labor was the party that famously uh, opened up Australia to competition in the 1980s and helped our exports globally competitive. Now, I hope one day to be part of a Labor government to help continue that legacy, uh, and I will always continue to support the cause of open and international trade and the importance of multilateralism. And with that, I thank you for your attention this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Madeline. Uh, we've come to the question and answer section of the evening. Uh, we've got about half an hour uh, to, just under half an hour to, um, to go through some questions. So we've got a bit of time. Uh, I'd encourage uh, anyone who's got any questions to think about it. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got, as I said, and, and, and as you've heard, three very different perspectives. Uh, very rich perspectives from 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 their own experiences and where they're working and and uh, how they're engaging on this issue. So, um, are there any questions uh, at this stage? Great. Okay. Um, thanks to the three of you for great presentations. I just want to pick up on something, Jeff, that you said. Um, I'm just wondering how much of China's actions are, as you say, the fragrant flagrant violation of international law versus, you know, plausible deniability within existing enforcement mechanisms. And to the extent that, you know, the WTO and can't resolve these things, I guess, efficiently, does it actually matter where we draw that line? There we go. Yeah. Um, it's both a flagrant breach of international law and also plausibly deniable. Both of those things are true. Um, a key thing to remember is there is no clause in the general agreement on tariffs and trade that says every other clause in this agreement is suspended if another country upsets your feelings. That the, the upset hurt feelings clause doesn't exist, um, it, <laughs> quite frankly. <clears throat> and, and so we, we've had a fairly febrile debate in Australia about this, but this is a larger question that's actually attracting a lot of international attention. It's in 2020, the Chinese government has said we literally do not care that this is in breach, complete breach of the WTO and complete breach of our bilateral trade agreement. We're just going to do it anyway. When they started getting pushback on this, we've seen a change in tactics over the last couple of weeks where we don't even have official trade measures. So some of you may have seen reporting, um, Daryl and I were talking about this earlier, where Chinese import agents have, been, had a, have gotten a quiet word from their local customs officials saying, no Australian products are going to get through the port, so don't even sign any contracts. Um, of course, all of this is, none of this is written down in an official circular. So this leads to the second point where it's also plausibly deniable because uh, good luck taking a quiet word down the pub to a WTO dispute panel. Um, it does say something for Australia and it does say something for the world that this is what China thinks its WTO membership means. Um, this is, uh, China has form for this. Um, Japan, Norway, Mongolia, Korea, Taiwan, Canada, <laughs> um, uh, one other in there too, Vietnam, have all been on the receiving end of these kind of sanctions before, albeit not on a $50 billion scale, usually a couple of hundred million dollars to make a point. Um, famously, they banned the export of um, salmon from Norway because the Nobel Peace Prize Committee gave the Nobel Prize to Liu Xiaobo, even though this is not actually under the control of the Norwegian government any, at all, which they pointed out to China repeatedly, but they got sanctioned anyway for an act that wasn't theirs. Um, and, and so the, the, the question that a lot of people around the world are going to have to grapple with is what when the world's second largest economy and the world's most trade intensive economy, the largest trader, doesn't think the global rules apply to it? Not a little bit or not just a grey area, but we do not feel so constrained. If you hurt our feelings, it's all out the window. Um, that's a serious problem for the entire world. And it really is something that, given China's form and doing this, is whatever we want to think about our own policies in Australia, which have their own, own challenges, as Madeline pointed out, that's on them, not on us. Perhaps 
China doesn't need our goods now. If China was on a great production um, sweep, they used our coal and gas to do it. But what are they uh, importing that they actually need? Are they producing enough food, wine, goods that they don't need us anymore? Need our iron ore, so we're we're the largest supplier of iron ore um, to China. Next is is Brazil at twenty percent of their needs. So we are a significant supplier of a raw material that they need to underscore and underpin uh, their their growth. So you know they've been impacted by COVID as well. And one of their domestic measures is to build infrastructure. If they're going to build infrastructure, they need iron ore. Iron ore produces steel, which then underpins that infrastructure. So they won't touch iron ore. They're more than happy to touch wine. They do produce, you know, some wine. There is a domestic wine supply within China. Not to the quality of our, of our particular product. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, a short answer is there's certain Australian products that they, they need and they can't get from... No, they can't get that from anywhere else. You know, so they, Brazil can't suddenly totally replace the quantities that we provide. It's just not, not possible. Thank you. What about other things like wheat and barley? I know we're in a global competition on some of those products, whether it be out of Russia... Um, you know, America, the EU, and all those countries, yeah. Canada, and all those countries are, we're in competition with them. So if they're not taking our product, they'll quickly pivot to other nations that are prepared to sell them what they need. I guess um, on that point, I mean, there was a media report today um, regarding coal, where instead of buying Australian coal, they are buying coal from other suppliers, but they're paying more. So I guess that's, at the end of the day, a, a policy decision on the part of China to say, okay, we're not going to buy the most competitive source of supply. Yes, Pardon? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, but we're, so they're making a decision to, to buy a more expensive product as they've more prioritized another national interest, which is to put forward a political point. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Chinese market is different to our market. Um, you know, when you look at, say, the wood sides of the world, independent from government, yes, they listen to policy, um, but they'll make business commercial decisions um, to the benefit of the, of the shareholder. In China's case, the Chinese Communist Party is the, the preeminent um, voice in that, in that country. And, and if they put out policy or put out a word... And I'm not sure, I mean, I'd imagine some of the people would have heard of the phrase SOE, so a state-owned enterprise. And there's about 100 of those in China. So they basically go and, and conduct business on behalf of China, but effectively representing the Chinese Communist Party. So if the Chinese Communist Party has a position that they want to adopt, they can impart that onto an SOE, who then will pay a higher price for coal than what they would normally and that's just the, the, the nature of that regime. You know, it's not a Western democracy. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it's causing significant challenges. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. Yeah, that was a, <clears throat> a good segue to my question because, yeah, we've been having this conversation, it feels like, for such a long time. We know that China's not a Western democracy. Uh, we know that there's different uh, business practices and... Um, I just want to know, I guess, from uh, you as the panel, um, from a government perspective, what is the government doing to try and better understand, I guess, some of those underlying cultural, um, I guess, foundations and adapt policy and adapt the way that we interact with China so that we can get a better outcome at the end of the day. Uh, and the same goes for business. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to as well when I ask how many people in the Australian both Liberal and Opposition Labor Party speak Chinese, have lived in China, understand Chinese culture, history, 
uh, people um, and the same goes for, I guess, our business leaders as well. Um, so I guess that's what I want to know what's happening in that space to better under understand China so that we can get better outcomes for our country in dealing with them. Um, you are right to point out the fact that there's a... Um a distinct lack of enthusiasm for more in learning more about our neighbours, uh, whether it be China or Indonesia or other other parts of our, our near uh, na regional neighbourhood. Uh, so I would say there is little uh, going on. The, the decline in uh, the, the teaching of Asian languages in Australia is uh, is unbelievably poor. I mean, I, I enrolled here. <laughs> to do a master's in international relations just this year, and I, I can't enrol to learn Bahasa. Like, I know it's not directly on your question, but it just goes to the point that I, we can't learn as a mature age student uh, the Indonesian language through the oldest university in the state. It, it seems remarkable, right? Um, but so I don't think anything's happening. Uh, I think uh, in government there is a distinct a lack of understanding of not just the Chinese culture but generally Asian cultures and I don't think there's much effort going in to change that uh, and you can't do these things overnight. I I also think we've got a government that, that signed up to a strategic uh, partnership with China and, and that was generally agreed. It had a you know a bit of a traumatic time uh, getting off the ground and um you know, Xi Jinping spoke to the parliament, to the House of Representatives, and, you know, that's not long ago. And we, we've gone from that state of our relationship to the state we're talking about tonight in a, in a pretty swift seven years or six years, is it? So it's, uh, it's kind of hard to understand how that's been allowed to happen. And I think there may be some neglect. I, I just think... There's, there's not the care of a relationship. It's all very well to sign these agreements and have these great visits, but if if these things aren't being paid attention to and, you know, six months later, you know, we do something, we don't think about it enough, we do something two years later, we didn't think about it again, these things just accumulate and soon you've got a country that's this authoritarian regime which can do anything, it can turn on a dime, it's suddenly got all these excuses against us and we were just sort of not watching out. So I, I think we've got to really um, pay more attention to our trade diplomacy uh, and have a few more people in government and opposition realise what uh, lacks language can – what effect that can have. And, and, you know, I'm not up for stifling debate, but I'm up for people speaking maturely and like adults and not being, you know – quite racist, which is what we do see against by some parliamentarians. Um, gentlemen? Anything else? I might just add. Just, <laughs> just add in, um, I think a lot of people may be familiar with the statistic that about a third of Australia's exports go to China. I think 32% last year, which is principally, I mean, the big dollar in that is iron or natural gas and coal. But what's interesting is that 32% isn't really what it feels like for any of the companies you're working with, Daryl. In some cases, it's a lot lower. Um, in other cases, it's a lot higher. Iron ore, 81% last year. Rock lobsters, 94% last year. So when there's a dodgy SPS action against Australian rock lobsters, or oh, they've got a lobster spot or something in Chinese ports, it's not 30% of your sales that are blasted out, it's all of them. Timber, 91%. Um, Cotton in the 90s as well, several others in the 80s. Um, and something to remember about that is that's a lot of eggs in one basket. As Madeline said, it's probably a pretty risky and difficult to manage basket as well. So that's a lot of eggs in, a, in the, probably the least secure trading basket you've got. Um, but we got there by doing something. The Australia did not have this trade relationship with China 10 years ago. 10 years ago, rock lobsters to China were practically non-existent. So it's not like this is a natural state of affairs that has always been and ever will be and we were just caught unaware, caught sleeping in 2020. There's been an element of the sleeping, but we, we have slept walk into that for a long time. China has formed, we're the 10th country to be subject to these kind of trade sanctions. Nine times it happens and we continue to send trade delegations. I'm personally very critical of Austrade's presence. It has almost as many Austrade offices in Chinese markets as it does in the rest of the Indo-Pacific region. When you're already doing 90% of your trade with there, why is the Australian Trade Promotion Authority 
putting more offices into the same market. That makes no sense. So that dependency is something that we had the choice in. It wasn't always like that, and we could do something different if we wanted. Thank you. So I was a bit remiss. Can you introduce yourself and uh, before you ask the question, please? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Stephen. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to the, um, all three of you for being here tonight. Um, just touching on a point that Jeff and Daryl were making, I mean, on one hand, um, I think 1,700 tariffs or regulations have been introduced over the past year, and supply chains are being disrupted by COVID and being bought domestically, and um, the big protectionist wave has been coming over across the world over the past two years, and maybe do so into the future. But on the other hand, um, uh, we've just signed ARCET, and we're signing, a, negotiating a free trade agreement with the EU, and potentially with the UK and other countries. So I guess, how do those two things reconcile each other? Should we be optimistic about the future? I'll, I'll, I'll come on our set later because I've got a personal attachment to this. Um, no, no, certainly all of the relevant free trade agreements um, do provide some significant opportunities for the provision um, of cross-border trade in goods and services. So RCEP, there's not fantastic things around goods, but some very, very significant opportunities around services. So it's not just, you know, if we manufacture an article. Um, you may have heard of the story uh, beginning of this week or end of last week now um, in relation to health services being provided into Indonesia you know, and a very, very significant contract being signed by an Australian health provider um, into the Indonesian market. And that's really on the back of um, the IACPA agreement, you know, allowing Australian companies to take a far greater um, ownership percentage, greater than 50%, which makes it then commercially viable. Um, but the one thing I do say about free trade agreements, all the time, uh, and I've only ever seen it on one DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade presentation, and that was last year. They finally had a slide up saying, this free trade agreement does not apply automatically. So if you as an importer or an exporter do not identify the potential opportunity to avail yourself of an import concession, for instance, inbound, outbound, the Australian authorities do not apply it automatically. So we've got a free trade agreement with China. So I have so many companies that import from China, they pay 5% import duty, which is a generated duty. And then I'll go, are you aware we've got a China-Australia free trade agreement? We've had it since 2015. And they go, oh, no, we weren't. Um, you know, so my criticism of, of government, and I was, a, I was a bureaucrat, so I was a customs officer for 13 years. Um, my criticism, criticism of government is they come up with these fantastic bilateral, multilateral agreements and then effectively wipe their hands of it. And I think Brendan said, and then it's up to business to go and actually try and deal with it. Indonesia one's probably a little bit different. They're throwing $35, $40 million um, post-implementation to help you know, um, kick-start it. And there would have been probably a dozen trade trade um, missions up there had we not had COVID. Um, so that's probably the first agreement where they've really thrown some big money to try and get that the juices flying around the opportunities between the two countries. But a, a lot of my work is going to companies saying, do you understand that free trade is not free? That you have to apply to actually access those concessions. Correct. And the other one was um, we had the head negotiator for the Indonesian agreement here last year going through the relevant details. And the opening remark was 99% of all the products now going into Indonesia will be free. Uh, five minutes later, oh, sorry, there's a sliding scale of when those import duties come down. Two minutes later, oh, sorry, we've also got quotas involved in certain products, which means once you exceed your quota, you're then paying normal duty rates going into that country. So the opening remark was, it's duty-free, everything's duty-free. And then within 10 minutes, I don't know, sorry, uh, the sliding scale is going to take 15 years for that particular product to go from 20, 30% duty down to something far less. Oh, and we've also got heavy quotas 
on those agricultural products, you know, whether it be lemons or carrots or potatoes. And it's just like, you know, you lost me after you. your opening remark was, it's all free and it's automatic. From a business perspective, it's not. So... I don't know. Um, j just as a comment on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, I just wanted to bust some myths. This is not a China-led agreement. Um, it went for ten or eight years of formal negotiations. Um, there were 32 rounds of them. Anyone who's been to a negotiation, I had the displeasure of going to two, knows that it was definitely not a China-led agreement if you'd been in the room with 16 countries at some of those points in time. In fact, if you try and tell some ASEAN members what to do, they'll do the absolute opposite and did for many years. Um, but it is actually it is a 15-country trade agreement. Uh, ourselves, the 10 Southeast Asian states, Japan, Korea, New Zealand. Um, so in terms of trade diversification, that this is being reported as Australia signed a trade agreement with China when they're bashing us is just not, not right. Um, and it indeed does open some new options that picks up right, Daryl, on your, you've got, to get a, you've got to get the paperwork to get these, take advantage of these. It's a really boring but really important example. It's if you trade something, you have to get something called a certificate of origin, which is basically an officially recognised this was made in Australia sticker on it. You have to go, CCI issues them here in WA, you've got to go and pay them to get one. And one of the big problems is before we had all these bilateral free trade agreements 20 years ago, you just got a WTO one. It was just a made in Australia product. You could sell it anywhere in the WTO. The WTO covers 98% of global trade, its members. So get one piece of paper, you sell it everywhere. Now you have to, there's a China free trade agreement, a Japan free trade agreement, there's one with Thailand. Um, and sometimes we can have multiple free trade agreements with different countries. So if you're selling something to Japan, do you do it under the RCEP agreement or the uh, CPTPP or the Japan one or the WTO one? They can all be different. Um, they're all active. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, then none of them ever get cancelled. And so, so, and particularly when you're looking at agriculture, one of the things is these are really often small businesses. And if you look at farmers, farmers know how to grow stuff. They don't know how to do complex paperwork. And you, you've got a great business sorting that problem out for them, Dale. But, but one, of the, one of the things about RCEP is it covers about, it's, it's all the Indo-Pacific. So it's about 80% of Australia's trade. It's not full coverage, but most of your markets are covered. And what it will let us do, and this is a very unsexy thing, but it really matters, is there will be a made in RCEP certificate that you'll be able to get. So you'll be able to go and do one. Um, if you're a large corporation with a head office on um, St George's Terrace, you've got a legal and governance and trade team who can handle having 12 things and thinking which one is the right one to use. But for a lot of small businesses that are doing this trade that have been affected by not being able to get into flights and stuff like that, it's, it's often a bloke or a woman and a dog. Right, like that, that is actually Australia's frontline export businesses around some of the services, around some agriculture stuff as well. And this is really going to open up a huge streamlining effect once we can use it. Dr. Sue Boyd. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I, I was a diplomat once, um, but uh, if, if I were advising government now, and that would be hard to get to follow my advice, I know, but you, you have, in fact, a lot of people who are very good at speaking Chinese languages, who are very conversant with the culture, who have lived in the country a long time, and they work in the foreign service, a lot of them, or in similar services. Um, I would say uh, to, to, to the Prime Minister, this problem is uh, clearly political. It's driven by the Communist Party of China. So it's actually no good trying to address the question anywhere else but to get in to, to communicate with, with the party. Um, that um, it's actually not useful for the government to say, oh, I have to talk to the right minister. I have to pick up, but he won't pick up the telephone. He won't respond to me. That's not the way that business is done. Business is done by people on, on the ground negotiating quietly with each other and discussing the issues and saying, look, this is the situation we're in. These are the, 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 the benefits and these are the costs. And, you know, we've got strong things in our relationship and we've got irritations now. What is the best way through this? And that'll be how it'll be resolved. It'll be resolved by that groundwork being done professionally and quietly and below the horizon. It won't be done by ministers posturing or prime ministers posturing or putting the Chinese in a situation that they've got the upper hand because if you want to talk to me and I don't want to talk to you, well, 
and get fucked, you know. I'm I'm the one that's calling call, calling the shots. So we oughtn't to give them those we, those ocu- those opportunities. We just need to be cleverer at managing this and negotiating this. And that's what I would say to government if I was still advising the government. Uh, I agree with Sue. Uh, <laughs> I, I said that when I worked for her too. So, uh, um, but but you're right, Sue. It's everything has. It seems to be in a. Um, it's not black and white. Like these things aren't simple, and we shouldn't pretend they are. We've got the list of fourteen things, and you know, we. Pardon me. We're not doing anything. No, we're not. But but we. Gee, we. we you know, th- there's this bizarre list that comes out of China, as you say, driven by the party. Uh, and again, it's an accumulation of things in response to the answer earlier that, that have just added up over a long time, basically ever since we, we signed CHAFTA. So, and I think the DFAT officials are probably doing their absolute level best. You're absolutely right. They're very talented people. They've, it's, a, it's a professional service that we send into China. It's not a, a political appointment uh, type service. So, they're deeply skilled and it's hard to know. Certainly for me, I get some briefings from government, but but not obviously what <laughs> government gets itself. But uh, it's hard to know what those relationships are like on the ground. And you're absolutely right. They are essential and critical and they should be able to do this quiet word and it, it, this work in the background, which they have been trained to do and have been doing for decades. What it feels like is that maybe they're not able to do it and a lot of that is, you know, emanating from China's stance on the wolf warrior type diplomacy where their diplomacy has changed a lot as well and I suspect that the connections we once had at that level that we desperately need uh, are challenged or not there. Uh, So that leaves us, I I think, and, um, you know, Daryl may disagree that that it's the, the business ties that are the only ones remaining and the closest ones and we could do with talking and listening to business instead of having them shut out. You remember a few months ago that when Twiggy had his, um, Andrew Forrest had that uh, press conference with the, the, the consuls general, a couple of them around the country and, you know, it was a bit Andrew Forrest in how he did it and, and that's what he does. But to be frank, there used to be a time when we would welcome a Chinese consul general speaking in a media conference if there was a significant uh, agreement or purchase or investment that had happened to be welcomed. And when that happened, it was treated like it was the, you know, the end of the earth. And you may have done it differently, but we can all say that. Uh, but I, I do think business people need to be a part of a national discussion because they're the ones that are now left to do the legwork as best they can. That's my, my comment on that. I, I think that's that's really important. And I, I, my, I guess my feeling is that there's been some really significant changes in the way that the Chinese political system operates in the last 12 months, in the last five to six years as well. And so possibly so some of those things that we had may have obsolesced on the other side and I, I am not on the ground enough to be able to comment as to whether we could have put new ones back in place as effectively as we could. It's certainly a harder operating environment than it's ever been. So you'd expect even if we were doing very well, we would be having less traction on those fronts simply by virtue of the way its system is closed to that kind of stuff over that period. Um, but business is important because Whatever your position on this, whether you think there's a negotiated off-ramp to save face with China or whether you're a strong, a very strong hawk and there's one in the parliament from that represents this state who, you know, thinks, well, we can't, we're eventually not going to be able to trade with China at all, so we need to diversify markets. Well, that's a business problem too um, because effectively getting into this situation where everything's getting hit and you go, oh, well, it's the same thing as the free trade agreement. We've given you a free trade agreement. Why aren't you using it? Oh, the relationship with China's just gone to shit. Well, why can't you sell your stuff to Indonesia or something else? Which is what happened to the barley farmers in May who had, they've had several years of drought, bad harvests, finally got a good rain forecast. Everyone's chucking in heaps. The day, the last week of the sowing, this hits them and they've got about a billion dollars of barley coming off for the first time and now it's got to be dumped somewhere else overnight. And, oh, by the way, you can't go to the market because the border's closed. You can't actually go up to Vietnam and talk to the partner in Vietnam about buying the barley. Um, 
that's business will feel abandoned in that situation. And whatever your view on the China thing, even if you really stro- have a stronger and hawkish view than I think we do here, it's still beholden to actually go, okay, well, if you've got to trade with somebody else now, well, government's going to help you to do that, not just pull the, we've done a free trade agreement, why isn't the private sector doing it? Because then that exposes Australia to a diplomatic coercion. So from a business perspective, um, certainly the larger guys in town, FMGs, Twiggy, um, and you know the likes of Woodside and the like, um, have got some political clout uh, domestically and potentially um, a position internationally. Um, but believe it or not, the majority of exporters are small to medium-sized enterprises. They don't have the political leverage um, you know, they may have only a very small industry association that may do minor advocacy work, but to go and make, um, you know, uh, direct contact with the Chinese Communist Party won't happen. SMEs need government to have policies in place. They need to have relationships at a level that gives them um, confidence. Um, they can trust those relationships. Um, they understand the markets, the, the, the government supports their actions in those markets. Um, but at the moment, you know, there was a good ABC article this morning which basically said, and it's the first time I've seen it written, um, a seafood exporter said, I had stuff that went off sitting on the tarmac in China. Um, I've got my next shipment ready to go. I'm not sending it. So, you know, they can't just automatically go, all right, I'm going to go and sell that to Indonesia. I'm going to go and sell that to Malaysia. It just doesn't happen. So, you know, and that's a small to medium-sized enterprise. could be a family business um, that had good long-term contracts. They've got those one-on-one relationships with a particular buyer um, in Shanghai, you know, who's then going to distribute it to the restaurants. Um, but if there is a quiet policy or an instruction that just says uh, that stuff's not getting off uh, the tarmac. Is a small business guy going to go, no, no, I'll send up the next shipment. You know, it's worth $50,000. Um, I've got insurance. If it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't go well, I'll just claim on insurance. Well, talking to my colleagues at Westpac this morning about these kind of trade issues and some credit insurance guys that deal with trade finance, um, it's becoming very, very difficult. So as a business owner, am I going to go, no, I'll, I'll put that stuff on the next ship. I know there's problems at the moment, but I'm big enough that I'll, I'll, I'll be able to wear it. Or, they won't. They won't. Or equally, I'll call up my mate on the Politburo and get it sorted, right? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, exactly. So we, we really need, um, you know, notwithstanding this good and, – and everyone said it. All the major business guys will go, you know, we've got good one-on-one relationships and that relationship is still good today. But they're being told from on high, you need to cease and desist in terms of potential trade. Um, so as a business owner, um, that market is now, you know, very, very difficult. Thank you. I think we've run out of time for questions. I had one which I'm not going to ask, but I'll leave you with the thought. Um, and I think, um, Jeff, you alluded to it. Um, it's about what policy responses, as a former policy wonk, you know, working in the trade policy area, is one of the, I guess, f- frames I look at things is what are other countries doing to diversify their trade? Are, are we missing a bit when we're not using some other policy tools to support exporters? Is it, you know, do we have a true Exim Bank? It's a debate that Jeff and I have had quite a bit. Uh, you know, Austrade and other trade, uh, on the ground trade support are the things that we're missing. If we're going to try and get diverse markets, there are some things I see on the ground that other countries do to, to encourage diversification of trade that I don't think that we are accessing. So anyway, that, that's a thought. I'll pass on to um, Gronje to, uh, to uh, say some final words and close the meeting. Thank you very much. It's been a great honor for me to mod- moderate this discussion. And It's been a very rich and uh, thought-provoking discussion. Thank you very much to the speakers and all of you. Thank you, Brendan.
So, uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise tonight. I really appreciated it. It was a fascinating discussion. Very sobering, I must say. It was a really very bleak outlook. But um, we've just got a small gift for each of you tonight. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sue? Printed? Western Australia. Printed is Victoria. Thank you. Oh, it's oh, <laughs> so, uh, so it's a copy of Sue's recent memoir. So we um, have um, some excellent holiday reading and really recommend if you'd like to escape into pre-COVID era. It's really good fun. Um, so thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you, 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 Thank you,